All right, what's up, guys? Today I'm going to be talking to you about quantum computing hoax. Quantum computers are a hoax. They don't exist. This thing you see right here is just... It's not doing what they claim it's doing. It's not performing these super fast calculations that are a million times faster than a than IBM supercomputer or whatever. You know, the government doesn't have these things ready to take over the world Skynet style with, you know, Terminator type AI robots that are going to kill us all off. <clears throat> so let's talk about how they're saying these things work and how I know that they don't exist. So quantum computing is the use of me quantum mechanical phenomena such as superposition and entanglement to perform a computation. A quantum computer is used to perform such computation which can be implemented theoretically or physically. Okay, so we're not going to we're going to concern ourselves with the physical implementation, right? We want an actual computer, not just theoretical papers that tell us we can have one. So let's see how we're actually going to make this. Uh, digital quantum computers use quantum logic gates to do computation. Both digital and analog approaches use qubits, aka quantum bits. Qubits are the fundamental quantum computing uh, piece and are somewhat analogous to the bits in a classical computer. Qubits can be in a one or a zero quantum state but they can also be in a superposition of the one and zero states. Okay, so in our classical computer, our bits are zero, one, which corresponds to the voltage of the electricity going through. So the higher voltage is the one, and the lower one is the zero. That's what separates it. The qubits <clears throat> have these states too, but they also have this special third state, which is both at the same time. So that's how they're getting that's what makes them faster. That's the claim, at least. That we can get a physical object to be both 0 and 1 at the same time. It can be in two states at the same time. So let's see what we're going to use to make this qubit work, this qubit idea, right? Our qubit theory has to become a physical manifestation somehow. So let's see how we're going to do that. Well, here's a couple of examples, ideas that we can use to actually implement this in reality not theoretically. The spin of an electron in which the two levels can be taken as the spin up and spin down, okay? Spin up one, spin down zero, whatever. Fine. Or the polarization of a single photon in which the two states can be taken to be the vertical polarization and the hor horizontal polarization, whatever the hell that means. In a classical system, a bit would have to be in one state or the other, yeah. However, quantum mechanics allows the bit to be in superposition, both states simultaneously. Property which is fundamental to quantum mechanics and quantum computing. So I'm going to show you that superposition has never been observed. And if that doesn't exist, then the fundamental building block of quantum computing is gone. And quantum computers don't exist either. That's essentially my argument here. Uh, so this talks about, it's just going over the same thing we just talked about. A very well-known example of a two-state system is the spin of a particle such as an electron that has these values, which is the reduced Planck constant. Okay, so that's pretty much our, that's our plan here. We're going to use electrons to show, or electrons as our physical manifestation of this quantum theory idea. Okay. <clears throat> Quantum superposition. An example of a physically observable manifestation of the wave nature of quantum systems is the interference peaks from an electron beam in a double slit experiment. Okay. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and show that an electron is both a wave and a particle at the same time. And we're going to talk about why uh, as we continue. So the double slit experiment is a demonstration that light and matter can display characteristics of both classically defined waves and particles simultaneously. Moreover, it displays the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics, blah, blah, blah. 
The experiment was first carried out by Thomas Young in 1801, and then later on by Davison and Germer. Uh, they're going to show that electrons show the same thing as light. So here's what this scientific cult that we live in is trying to get us, trying to make us believe. They're trying to do this little sleight of hand trick here, where they're saying light is both a particle and a wave at the same time. And what I think is it's a wave and there's no way to show that it's a particle. There's no experimental evidence ever that light is a particle. Photons do not exist. <clears throat> That's my claim. I think it's all pseudoscience garbage, religious cult BS. So let's see what Thomas Young did in his interference experiment. Uh, one thing, at Thomas Young's own judgment, this was the most important of his many achievements. Uh, this is propaganda BS. Okay? We're going to go through the sources of his work, his own writings, and I'm going to show you that he only talks about this experiment in like two sentences in his entire career. And this is the guy that they say... Uh, Look, they just name drop here, whoever the hell this is. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, Albert Einstein. The last man that knew everything. You know, and here's, this is actually the title of a book, which I'm going to show you here. Young is credited with establishing the wave theory of light influenced by the works of Isaac Newton. So, the last man who knew everything. Let's take a look at that book. So, here you see our picture that we saw earlier on the Wikipedia page. This is... This is not where they got the picture. This book got the picture from the older book, which is Thomas Young's actual book. This is a book about that book. And here is a quote verbatim from Thomas Young's own book describing his experiment. This right here, this paragraph, this is the entirety of Thomas Young's description of this double slit experiment. The most important of his many achievements right here okay so let's see what he did the simplest case appears to be when a beam of homogeneous light falls on a screen in which there are two very small holes or slits which may be considered as centers of divergence from whence the light is diffracted in every direction in this case when the two newly formed beams are received on a surface placed so as to intercept them their light is divided by dark stripes into portions of nearly equal but becoming whiter as the surface is more remote from the ap apertures so as to subtend very nearly equal angles from apertures at all distances and whiter also in the same proportion as the apertures are closer to each other. I, this is painful I know but just bear with me. I'm just going to read this whole thing once. The middle of the two portions is always light and bright stripes on each side are such distances that the light coming to them from one of the apertures must have passed through the longer space than that which comes from the other by an interval which is equal to the breadth of one, two, three, or more of the supposed undulations, i.e. one, two, three, or more wavelengths, while intervening dark spaces correspond to a difference half a supposed undulation of one and a half two and a half or more. So if you're anything like me, that made absolutely no sense to you. Uh, here's a drawing of what he's talking about. Uh, I'll have to show you a video of somebody performing this with a laser and a double split, you know, modern day. But basically he put, he put a piece of like cardboard. They didn't have cardboard back then, but you know, a thick piece of paper over a window and he cut two slits in it. And then the light from the sun came in and made this pattern on the table or floor or whatever. So you got light, dark, light, dark. And then it, and he's saying it widens out as it gets further away from the, the holes. And this is brighter in the middle than on the outside. That's what all this, that's what all this says right here. So let's see where this guy got this from. We can zoom in here on the Bible. This is the same book. 
his bibliography, Natural Philosophy and the Mechanical Arts, Taylor and Walton, 1845. This is, yeah, I don't know, I must have lost that book. Anyways, this is, this is Thomas Young's actual book. This is A Course of Lectures on Natural Philosophy and the Mechanical Arts. So these, apparently he went out and gave all these talks at, uh, I want to say it was Oxford, but he gave a series of lectures there. Uh, some, either he gave his lecture papers to this guy or he wrote some of this book you know it, it's kind of unclear to me but anyways here he is talking about his experiment the interference one so here's that paragraph that I just read to you verbatim so this is where he got it from and that's it so you got a 796 page book the most important experiment of his life. And we've got, you know, this, this paragraph. So you can see the next one. In a composition of various experiments, Brett's, you know, he goes over some of the details of it. You know, whatever. So a couple paragraphs. In his whole life, 800 page book there. Here's volume two. Uh, a course of, so yeah volume 2 here's volume 1 here's volume 2 798 page book or 738 pages there let's see what he's talking about zoom in In making some experiments on the fridges of colors accompanying shadows, I have found so simple and so demonstrative a proof the general law of interference of two portions of light, which I have already endeavored to establish. I think it right to lay down before the Royal Society a short statement of the facts, which appears, uh, yeah, he's just, he's talking, read before the Royal Society in 1803. So he's reading some of his work, Thomas Young. Okay, so here's volume one, volume two of The Man Who Knew Everything. His experiment, a couple paragraphs there, sentence here referring back to the original thing. And I think it was this. This is where they got the picture from. Maybe it was up here. This is where Wikipedia got their picture from. Here we go. There it is. See, there's the exact picture that they lifted from this book and put on Wikipedia. So this is his work. Uh, he put a piece of paper over a window and watched the light come down and observed this pattern and determined that it was uh, lights a wave. And I'll show an experiment or a video later on that explains that. Here's here's another book. Thomas Young. The miscellaneous works of Thomas Young, including his scientific memoirs, documents, etc. Volumes 1 and 2, written by this guy posthumously, you know, based on his work. Interference. Can't even see this. had discovered a case which appeared to be the exception of the general law of whatever but was afterwards explained by the theory of production of colors by interference when applied to transmitted light. That's it. This most important discovery in his memoirs, 639 pages, one sentence for the man's most important discovery. See, this is a total fraud. They used this guy's, you know, random ass work to validate what they needed to validate. They needed to show that it was a wave and a particle at the same time. So they said, hey, light's a wave. 
now we're going to have to make this jump somehow to show that it's also a particle at the same time. Well, why do they need to do that? Well, let's see. Uh, so let's talk about the second experiment. So that experiment, that showed that it was a wave. But remember, our quantum physics says that it has to be both, right? It has to be able to be a wave and a particle at simultaneously you know, in order for our quantum computer to work. So these guys now, they're going to demonstrate that electrons show the same behavior as light, which is later extended to atoms and molecules. Okay, so let's take a look at the second experiment, which forms the basis of quantum computers. Okay, so these guys, these guys are doing the electron beam gun thing. Where did that go? So that's where this comes from. Let's take a look at this picture. These guys are going to take their electron beam gun, they're going to shine it at the double slit, and they're going to observe the same thing on the screen. Okay, this is what Thomas Young observed. The brighter line in the middle, getting, you know, more faded as you go out interference pattern okay interference pattern there's my aperture there's my double slit these waves are gonna cross and they're gonna double up right here on these solid lines so that's why these are brighter because you got the waves doubling up here and you get the gaps in between lights a wave All right, so now we're going to show that electrons are waves, I guess. Uh, okay. Their electron gun scattered by the surface of... So they're going to shine their electron gun on a metal or a nickel plate, nickel metal plate. And the electrons, I guess, are going to bounce off this plate and display this wave pattern on the, you know wall or whatever the viewing apparatus and so therefore the connection is made right because electrons are little particles and after we've reflected off this they're gonna go onto the wall and display that they're also waves at the same time okay why why do they need to do this again because that's how quantum computers work they have to be in two states at the same time but there's actually another reason okay so according to Maxwell's equations in the late 19th century, light was thought to consist of waves of electromagnetic fields, and matter was thought to cons consist of localized particles. All right, so up until Albert Einstein came along and said, with his you know, photoelectric effect, uh, Nobel Prize winning paper, everyone just thought, we have two different things here, right? Light's a wave, particle's a particle. Well, Albert Einstein comes along and says, no, 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 no. Light's, all, light's a particle. Okay. And he needed that to prove his other theory of general relativity, which we may get into some other time. So this was... He had to have this. <laughs> you know? It's not like anybody's out there observing these photons. This is just all theoretical. He has to have photons, or his theory is just bunk. And they gave him a Nobel Prize for it anyway, even though he never you know, never demonstrated fucking dick. So that's that's why we have to do this. We have to show that, because we can't invalidate the great god of Albert Einstein. We can't invalidate his infinite wisdom. So we're going to come up with this fake-ass experiment that shows that light's also a particle. So let's see what they did. Oops, getting ahead of myself. Okay, the electron gun was a, a heated tungsten filament that released thermally excited electrons, which were then accelerated through an electric potential difference, giving them a certain amount of connection, kinetic energy towards nickel crystal. That's a fucking light bulb, dude. That is a fucking light bulb. The electron gun is a heated tungsten filament. That's a light bulb. 
So what's this uh, electric potential difference thing? Okay, electric potential and potential difference. Batteries lift charges to a higher potential. There's a potential difference because of this shit, right? You remember doing this in school. You hook the wire of the one end of the battery up to your light bulb, and then you take the wire off the other end, end of the light bulb and hook it up to the negative end of the battery, and the, the light bulb lights up. That's it. That's all they're doing. That's all this electron gun is, is a fucking light bulb. You know? And if you had, if you had a really a fancy, you know, science class... They also had the little knob on there where you can adjust the voltages and the light bulb will get brighter and dimmer as you go. I'm sure all of you did this in grade school. So that's what these guys did. They made their little light bulb apparatus. And they, see here's the voltages they used. So they had the knob too. And then they shined it on their little crystal plates, their nickel crystal plates. Okay? Shine it on the plate it's going to reflect off onto the wall and then we're going to take our measurements we're going to show you all our complex math that we did to verify that what we're doing is legitimate you see that's what this is it's a math call this is you can think of it as how like the bible was written in latin and, you know only the priests were able to read it so they had this complex not really complex but they had a foreign language that the average person couldn't read Okay, they're doing the same thing with math now, and this is apparently the intensity of it. So they measured the intensity off the screen or whatever. More intense in the middle, drops off as you go out. So that's it. That's what they did. They took a light bulb, they shined it on metal, and then they said, therefore, electrons are waves. I mean... Are you are you fucking kidding me right now? All you did was shine a light on it. There's at what point are we proving that A photons are particles that actually exist and B electrons are particles that actually exist? Who in the, who is it proving either of these? I mean, I'm not seeing it. So if you don't have you don't have particles you know we had our two choices of the the spin of the electron and the, the polarization of the photon where are these particles there's no experimental evidence for them you got a guy poking two holes and a piece of paper over a window and two other guys shining a light on a fucking piece of metal and we're calling this a quantum computer so there you go that's quantum computing in a nutshell